Right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the University Open Source call, <laughs> which is all good by me, not OSPO. Um, so today's very challenging question is if you've ever stayed up all night by choice. And stargazing, that is, that's good. Comic day, I, I like that. All right, a couple exams. Yes, mine was a chemistry final, and <laughs> I see an econ exam. I like to think that staying up all night got me an A on the final. <laughs> I'm sure it did not. <laughs> you know, I did not get an A on my final. <laughs> I did not get an A. One, one of the keys, if you're going to stay up all night, make sure that you're also tired when you take the test. I'm sure I was exhausted. Because, yeah, because <laughs> if you're not, then you don't remember the things you learned when you were exhausted. <laughs> Megan not admitting to anything, I see. <laughs> It's also okay. <laughs> All right. All right. If somebody could just kind of keep an eye on, okay, Don, I just make sure you got the minutes there. Don, yep, university seems to be a culprit of staying up all night. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so if somebody could drop the minutes in the chat as other people join, that would be great. Um, I, I know we want to get through, we want to get down here today to talk about kind of a few things with respect to um, specific parts of this model um, and how people are thinking through this. Um, but I did want to just take a few minutes just as I was looking back over the minutes from last week, just always trying to consolidate what we talk about and continue to frame it so that it doesn't just keep widening out. Um, so just what I pulled out here was kind of the conversation about what y'all are doing at your respective universities. Um, this is by no means set and you can make changes here, but demonstrating value and impact of open source within the university, maybe within an external too. as I think about it. Um, I think this was with respect to faculty. One of the very particular points that came up was uh, the RPT process um, for students, thinking about kind of the education setting and career opportunities, how we consider corporate or external organizational engagements, probably broaden that a little bit, and then foundation relationships. So those were the kind of the areas that I think were, that had come up last week. So it's a very, very broad way of thinking about things. Um, it did make me think kind of as I had worked through kind of setting up all of these minutes that there do seem to be a very clear set of things that are um, considered internal to the university, open source related, you know, questions that we have, say if it's about um, education or classes or things like RPT, those are kind of very inward looking at a university, I understand they can have like external connections, but generally speaking, um, they're internal to the university. Um, but then also thinking about things like social impact or foundation relationships, those are a bit more external. So it's just something that had crossed my mind uh, as we were, as I was kind of going through these minutes. Um, does anybody have some, this will grow a little bit, but does anybody, this is trying to set the mission. Does anybody have reaction to this list? Yeah, I think so. I think that's fair. Um, you had talked a lot about the 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 slide deck that you put together, Saeed, particularly around the UN. I think that's a, a fair, fair point. How about that? Done. <laughs> Shift tab takes care of your <laughs> takes care of your comment. And say, do you think community impact also addresses kind of social impact as well? Are these two different things for you? I, I mean, I'd say so, um, okay. but I'm I'm certainly open to alternative views. Okay, what do other people think? Any reaction? Okay. Yes, yeah, I like it. Okay. I mean, I think it's it's the principal concern, so it's well thought about. Okay. Um, well, this is great as, as I, um, in terms of faculty. Yeah, so for sure, Stephanie, these are just 
mostly these were points that I had just pulled out from the meeting minutes below. And so, I was also wondering, like, did you want to try and keep it like one one bullet point each? So, you know, like, I was trying to keep it fairly short and concise, yeah. just as we said. I didn't want to statement. add that necessarily. Like, the things, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just as we are working as a group, these are kind of the areas that we were paying attention to. And these models will help us look a little bit deeper. Um, okay. Uh, I did also, we had kind of had a discussion about the partners with whom we have strong connections. I just wanted to continue to put this up. It's not meant to be a landscape map by any means, but you know, I think for those of you that are connected with any of these groups, this it would be great, whether it's um, CSCCE, Curious, Helios, whatever it might be, that as you have um, discussions with these other groups and you want to bring it back here, you think it's important, please do. Uh, that's the, the the more we can work together and the less we can repeat each other, I think is, is the way to go here. So, all right. Um, so I think last week we had kind of left off, um, Mike is not feeling well today, I don't think, but we had kind of left off with a few folks maybe thinking through some of these um, particular parts of this model that we have. So I know Saeed, you had agreed to kind of speak a little bit towards research excellence, Stephanie towards research translation, and Tom, I don't know if Tom is on right now. Uh, he's not, he's actually not feeling well either. Okay, okay, well, that, that's gonna, that's gonna be Stephanie and Saeed today. So um, Saeed, do you want to, do you have you want to lead us here a little bit and kind of give us your thoughts around research actuals, and then we can move to Stephanie? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I'm just hoping to see conversation more than anything, I think. Um, so if you go to the uh, slides, then I marked up the ones for research excellence. And I know you said before we're not, you know, constrained to two slides or, or however many numbers, but not a bad idea to try and do it within two slides, I don't think. So um, with that in mind, I tried to just basically think about, you know, if I had to ask two of the biggest kinds of questions, if you will, around research excellence and open source software, um, it would primarily be around advancing research, um, and certainly in this particular facet. Uh, and then the, the other one would be funding, just to be, you know, I don't know, blunt about it, I guess. Um, so the, the first slide basically just, <clears throat> excuse me, emphasizes that, emphasizes that idea of, uh, you know, to Stephanie's point, faculty member, even students, you know, I care about my research, how does this help me? And then the questions that are listed there, in essence, are, I think, uh, you know, examples of how that could be uh, connected to it. So the idea of open source as a way of building up collaboration, um, you know, there are... I believe many faculty who actually want to work with other faculty within the university, but don't necessarily know how or, or how to start and open, soft, open source software being a pathway to make that happen. Uh, and then yes, an OSPO can help with that, right? It's sort of being a university clearinghouse, if you will, for that kind of function. But then also the engagement with uh, external communities. So open source software being an easier way, I mean, arguably easier way for a community member to, to become involved or at least in, inspect and review the type of research that's being done. So I also did ask these questions, uh, keeping in mind Mike's earlier comment that the four are really interrelated. Um, so rather than going too deeply into any one of those other facets, I'm trying to refer to them and then the other ones could, could try to flesh that out, I suppose. Um, and the second question, uh, which, which isn't a question, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I guess I could say, what are, what are examples? How's that? We can fix it, don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so the second set of words uh, is trying to pick up on what I think are, uh, certainly Carnegie Mellon, but I think many universities right now, uh, big big topics of interest, reproducibility, open science, and AI. Um, but we can add others or edit those, of course. And then the last one starts to get at, let's not forget about the students, um, who in many cases, of course, contribute to the research. They don't just consume it. Uh, and then the students are, are, of course, very focused on their educational experience and also working with the community. 
Um, so again, that's an attempt to connect to the other slides or other facets. Um, should I go to the next slide or should we pause here and see? Maybe we could pause here and- Okay, sure. Yeah, see how people people's yep. reaction to these. Yep, any, any feedback's welcome, of course. Maybe thinking about how these uh, questions would fit within your own setting at your university. Mm -hmm. I think the last item kind of discloses a sort of a truth that teaching and research are not mutually exclusive, that there is more of an overlap than a distinction in some of these activities, which I think it's okay. Just wanted to explicitly state that. Yeah, Sean, I agree, but I actually think that makes me even happier about those set yeah. of words because that, yeah, that's, yeah, that's that's a good theme to to reinforce. I guess. Right. No, I'm not unhappy about it. I just, I think uh, the way it's laid out, it makes us think a little bit about these things as distinct from each other, and there is some overlap. In fact, so I think I'm really intrigued by how the collaboration piece about how that's done and how people explore and understand how to do it. Um, like I, what I'm doing right now in, in my program is having students work in open source and we're learning how to do the collaboration well. And I think demonstrating that when we work with, with faculty or researchers or grad students, like showing what good collaboration actually looks like, I'm able to like speak to how that works and what we learned and like to, to give that context in that way, I think I think will we'll work a lot better to convince people to actually do that well. Because a lot of, Collaborations ad hoc in some forms, and and um, we can kind of bring knowledge to that by by doing by experiencing and doing it ourselves and showing what that can look like. Said, I think one thing. So these do resonate, and these questions are great. Um, one thing I might add to that the student experience is um, uh, job prospects. So. Um, depending on the open source project, um, this can have a great deal of bearing on um, career development after they leave um, for students, I think. And we're, we don't know, <laughs> uh, but we have a lot of um, evidence that suggests that's true. So that's a really good point. Um, thanks for, for, for mentioning it. Yeah, yeah and I, I like actually the term career building because obviously some students go on to graduate school or yeah. become, community organizers, whatever, it's not necessarily, you know, the sort of IT job. Um, we we are hearing a lot of students at Carnegie Mellon are saying, uh, I can't tell my open source story once I leave Carnegie Mellon, right? And can you help me do that? So I think that resonates with with your, your observation. And it's much harder to break into a proprietary ecosystem, right? Like you better right. go work for that company first. Um, whereas you can actually yes. join an open source project and do something meaningful and, you know, make a reputation for yourself. Yeah, we had, uh, I mean, data point of one, but I think he represents other students. Um, one of the students who's very actively involved in open source activity, Carnegie Mellon, um, we're, we're evaluating a tool called Scarf. I don't know if I've mentioned that before here. Maybe I have. Um, and when he saw the demo, uh, he said, oh, so you can tell me what companies are using stuff that I produce, right? Um, and when we asked them later, why did you bring it up? <laughs> because I'll apply for a job to this company. So, you know, it's a perfectly reasonable perspective. Yeah, I was gonna say, I also definitely see that with the undergraduates we've worked with in mentorship projects that they're, I mean, I don't, I don't have all of the, like I, it, it actually now spurs me to think I need to do a little like alumni, uh, a review of who's now still who what companies you went with and what you know what whether the open source experience you had with us um had direct impact on it and i know yeah like you said i don't have i know that there are definitely folks who were benefit and had direct uh career impact and some of them definitely are not just going into industry but going into academia due to the work that they had with with us so i think that that's a that's about that i like that that connection and I see it in the research translation discussion too. So I like that it's an overlap. Uh, could I ask a question, Saeed? So this 
or, or to anybody that these questions are resonating with. So like Zach, if these are resonating with you, you know what I mean? Or Kendall, if these are resonating. So this column here, metrics and metrics models, if I was to um, change this temporarily and say, um, so like, so there you go. So where do you even begin to point yourself <laughs> to answer some of these questions. This will help in the development of metrics and metrics models, because we can define these as things that we would like to do, but then providing guidance on how to uh, get that data and use that data is really important in any metric development or metric model. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start, but oh no, Kendall, go ahead. We can all I don't think I have a great answer for that. So like, I mean, a lot of the stuff we can't see, like I don't have other photos of everyone that's working at my university. I can't see all things that are happening. So I can find projects that I've identified and connected with, and I can measure that there. But the larger picture is quite difficult to parse. Yeah, I mean, I'll, um, I don't want to put Angela on the spot, uh, but I will put Angela on the spot. <laughs> Because <laughs> it's my understanding that um, you had reached out to GitHub uh, to, to to try and get you know that GitHub Innovation Graph view at UT Austin. So you know maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. But that might be one way. Uh, I think case studies are another way, right? They're a little bit more resource intensive, but just actually describing qualitatively what happened, um, and then using things like Turja, you know, come to mind. Does anybody have any interest in the um, CZI software mentions data set? But there, um, I'll, okay, I'll, I guess I'll answer my own question. I guess I do. <laughs> so um, uh, it's unclear how like helpful or authoritative it is really because you know there's a lot of noise in the signal, but it's something. Um, so. Uh, I think uh, if we look at kind of the long tail of that one, um, and it's available on Dryad, so if anybody wants to poke at it, I would be interested in doing that with them. Zach, Sean, I see your hand up. Zach, is this with respect to this first question, the CZI data set? Yeah, sort of like the problem of, I guess I was riffing off of what someone was saying earlier, like the problem of like the totality of all of it and how hard it is to get your arms around it. I like, what Saeed was saying a lot in terms of going through GitHub, um, that makes a lot of sense too. Um, but I was just, uh, I was thinking about the CZI um, data set as, a, as another tool to maybe uncover a couple of things, not to come up with like an authoritative picture. Gotcha. Could you drop that in here if you have it or in the minutes? Yep. Thanks. Sean. Well, I was just going to ask if that was the James Howison analysis of uh publications or is that uh, internal to CZI? Um, I think, well, it had a lot of contributors. I don't remember the names of all of them. If there was like okay. a lead author. Yeah. That's cool. I'll, I'll get that. There's a, um, there's an archive paper and then there's raw data on, um, on Dryad. I'll, I'll, I'll cool. put it in the chat. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Stephanie. Yeah. Um, I, I want to, I, I don't know if Angela had wanted to specifically talk about her GitHub experience, but we are definitely doing something similar to what say referred to, um, or, or we're in the process of trying to create uh, uh, a project that has like a little bit more powerful discovery tools uh, for all of the UCs with regards to what's actually out there. And then using Baturgia uh, as part of our project to, to refine them and get like a better picture. But um Another one, I don't know who's been, I think a few of you know um, the work that um, Apero is doing, Aperio is doing uh, around this. They And maybe that's a group we should add to the, um, to to our list as well, because uh, um, Flat Patrick, God, I just couldn't come up with his name. Uh, Patrick and I talked like last, last week and it was really interesting because I think that the efforts that they're looking to to promote also talks is is about discovering the the extent of open source uh, within the university setting in like different sectors. And I think that was that helps with this question of how to find stuff because it helped. He I think the idea of doing case studies in different 
uh, universities, but I also think it's a good model that univers that at OSPO or those interested in open source in a specific university could follow, you know, at, at, you know, to try and answer, uh, you know, these questions, particularly that, that first one of how much, you know, quantifying then and qualifying to some extent, uh, the, the, the level of collaboration, uh, within, within, uh, within your particular campus. Cool. Thank you. Um, Angela, did you want to talk about what UT is doing with the GitHub innovation graph stuff? Well, what we hope to do is um, map out who's doing what and where on our campus for sure, um, understanding where they're connected. So seeing where their software is reaching to and in what open source communities uh, we're touching and uh, uh, participating in. Um, so this is laying the groundwork so that we can understand you know, where in the ecosystem people are, how to connect people to resources, and then how to move them along our pathway for, um, for that's kind of specific to us. But uh, with the idea being that um, there are two goals, one, understanding our ecosystem better, but two, understanding the impact of where software goes and the research impact that it might have so that people can start communicating back on return on investment to their deans when they start talking about, you know, my 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 publication might get this far, my software has gotten this far, um, but that's that's the that's partial. Those are our two goals with 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 doing that that map. Um, so, I suspect oh, it's a hunch that everybody on this call will want to know how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> so if you. Wouldn't, uh, you know, just as you're moving through this process and yeah. you know, questions and just, I don't know, I'm sure everybody would love to hear how that's going for you over time. Yes. Um, yeah, we just started doing the, 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 the survey collections and James Howison is actually on our team. So we're trying to talk our um, Office of Sponsored Projects into letting us go into the FAR system, which is our faculty repository of, of research and learn uh, and do a, a crawl for the the words open source software research. Uh, he's got a whole bunch of keywords that we're working with. So both in the FAR system and then um, in the grant publication system that we have. So we're gonna try to crawl both those spaces to come up with a map, but we'll see, we're, we're just in the initial stages. We also have surveys going out and things like that. So traditional ways of getting data as well. Okay, cool. Um, Stephanie? I actually, yeah, and I'd like to swap notes with you on that because we are doing very similar thing with our OSP. And we haven't, we've just been so overwhelmed with other work. We haven't gotten back to them on, they're actually, there's like a person within our, our office of research who is like, a, would be the person, like, would be able to do this for us. So we don't even have to do it. Uh, so I'd like to like get, like, you know, see what kind of, um, just what keywords you think make the most sense uh, or and what, compared to what we are thinking, but also, um, we had similarly our we had wanted to use we have an intake form that everyone is supposed to fill out when they start the process um of asking for for grant yeah for in in the proposal process um and i'm not sure if you've had any like having like adding a little button that says is this is anything from this proposal going to be open source um and that's what we would like to do we've got a little pushback because the system is kind of uh, already overloaded with questions, as I just found out yesterday when they added yet more questions, <laughs> export control needed questions I hadn't seen before on, on a new proposal. So, um, but yeah, I'd be interested to see if anybody else has had uh, any, uh, if that has been something that people have, an, an option that people have uh, tried to to do and talk with. I We definitely, we, we didn't get a complete pushback on from OR on it generally, but just because there is already so many questions on the intake form, they're trying to like, oh, I don't want to add another one. So, uh, but that may be one option, depending on what your intake forms look like. That's a really good idea. Yes. Uh, so you, your hand is up. Oh. Yeah, do you have a comment or a question, new question? Uh, I, I, sorry, a, a personal time check. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to have to leave in about five or 10 minutes. So just wondering if you want me to briefly describe the next slide or we can let the conversation keep going. It's up to you. Oh, this is great. I think even if we can, you know, it's... Slow and steady. I think we have kind of 
where you talk about these three questions and kind of getting some sense of what um, can be in this top box. And I don't think it's important that we go through all three right now. And so okay. you want to talk about the next one? Yeah. Sure. Um, so this is the second facet that I thought was important, you know, just again, just candidly, how much funding, how much impact um, can can you track or can you connect to open source software? Uh, so the three questions reflect that. One, of course, is directly uh, how much, you know, of the funded projects uh, are either consuming, contributing, or, or you know, maintaining open source software. Um, increasingly anecdotally, you know, um, I hear a lot of faculty saying couldn't really do this without open source or it makes it more efficient, it makes it cheaper, all those kinds of things. I'm deliberately avoiding things like cheaper. Um, I don't fully know why, but I just don't want to get into <laughs> questions around costs and things like that, I guess. Uh, the second question is more um, sort of broader ecosystem based, right? How much of the funding agencies emphasizing open source software? How much is Office of Science and Technology Policy emphasizing open, open source software, so on? The NSF post program, of course, comes to mind or the Sloan grants come to mind. But I, you know, NIH, I think, is, is starting to have some programs around open source software too. So just that's the kind of input, you, you know, lots of people in universities, not just faculty, uh, will, will be interested in seeing. And then the third question, again, is one of those, let's try to connect to the other facets of, of the framework, uh, particularly around research translation, um, because how much does open source software support what I will call traditional, I guess, um, you know, technology transfer and new forms of, of impact or, or funding with, particularly with communities that don't typically interact with tech transfer offices. thoughts on some of these questions that Saeed is putting forward here? I guess maybe the first is, do they uh, make sense within your context as things that, that if you could magically answer, this would be helpful. <laughs> Yeah, these are great questions. Yeah. They, again, totally resonate. Um, the tech transfer one is super interesting, Saeed. I think that there's a um, an area I need to explore here, and I don't want to get ahead of myself. But um, there is a there's a whole there are open source business models that don't make sense to our tech transfer offices, and yet they're the ones who primarily back our startups. So they're leaving a ton of value on the table. And so I have to be really careful with how I start this conversation. Um, but if anybody else is having that same conversation, um, I would love to compare notes with you. So Sean, do you have a response to this? What I, I mean, my own experience is similar to yours. Initially our IP, our tech transfer team really views something that we own that is intellectual property with a patent is the kinds of thing that those are the kinds of things they are accustomed to commercializing. They are beginning to understand open source software as a pathway for commercialization, but it's a pathway. You're correct. In my experience, I agree with you. They're not familiar with it. And so I've been working on educating our IP lawyers for about four years and it's a slow process. Yeah, I'd love to learn from your experience, Sean, and maybe Stephanie too, with like, you know, Seth and things like that. So the, the model that we don't, well, that office doesn't really have their arms around is the one where you give away the software, but you provide a company with professional services, and then that can be its own, you know, colossally successful uh, company, which those happen anyway, just with no help from our tech transfer office. So like, I feel like there's a ton of missing opportunities. Yeah, I could. I have a lot of detail. Yeah, does it? I the, yeah, the stuff model is. I mean, it, it's not one that I think we've. Uh, I mean, it's one we point to, but it's not always an easy one to um, emulate just because of the uniqueness of how that came about. But uh, it did push. It did really open the eyes of our tech transfer people. Of well, you know, we probably wouldn't have gotten two and a half million dollars if we would have made Sage while uh, you know put a patent on this and gotten the money out of it. But we got two and a half million dollars just from him handing us two and a half million dollars after he made money off of it. So it's one of those, 
one of those kind of things of, uh, yeah. So where where it's not necessarily it's, it's not as direct of an idea. Yeah, it, they don't have this direct of a connotation mm -hmm. before that of how open source impacts it, and it's just different than than their standard model. So that yeah, we we should definitely talk. I think it is also something where we're looking at. It doesn't make sense. I mean, we haven't had a repeat in that way of that model, but we've had very successful projects. So it's also that idea of not everything has to go through the startup process um, to be seen as successful and have both a financial and, and research benefit. And I think that that's, those are the discussions we're still having. Um, we were, like I said, we've always been pretty lucky that our former head of you know, vice chancellor for research was Seth's was um was part of the Seth project and Sage's um, ad advisor. So uh that you know that had a we had a foot in, and then our new vice chancellor is also very open because he also uh, he he knows the history. Uh, but it's not you know it's I, I we, it's a great case study to use I think and something we probably should build up more to be able to share. So yeah, Saeed. So, uh, Stephanie, you you said this, but I just want to really put a strong you know, emphasis on this is also something the fundraising folks at universities should be involved with. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, that, that this is a new form of fundraising, and that's also a uh, awareness building, <laughs> you know, mindset, culture change yeah. type of conversation too. It's but like, I, yeah. I I think that's there's a lot of potential for that. Yeah, it's a good point of like getting the tech transfer people to talk to the research development people. <laughs> and, and they're on the same department. They're in the same office, but they, they don't recognize that, you know, but yeah, it's, it's a good point of like, it, maybe this isn't a tech transfer moment, but, uh, you know, a foundation's moment, so. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah, Kendall. Yeah, and I, I know, and Stephanie, I think you were on at least one of those calls. There was a sequence with some of the tech transfer people talking about open source as part of tech transfer with like Andrew Wickman at, at John Hopkins. And there was like, I think CMU, University of Michigan, like RIT, like things that they were talking about this question and, and from the tech transfer side of being not open source or OSPOs, how they're thinking about it and opening conversations about it, which I thought was really fascinating and fun. This is great. Part of what I'm saying, I don't know how much longer you can stay, but uh, so I just put in the note that I should probably head out now. So <laughs> no problem. One of the things that I'm starting to kind of see here is that it seems like some of these questions may be approachable. Uh, so if we look at this first one through technology and maybe metrics, things that we could potentially measure. Um, or like Angela, what you were pointing out, like actually trying to get numbers on the number, or get figures on the number of proposals that contain particular keywords, you know, trying to take a look at that. But some of these conversations, like the tech transfer one that just showed up, it's a little less about metrics um, and a little bit more about uh, like yeah, having a, a conversation, Stephanie, as you had said, with research development and tech transfer. We're trying to get tech transfer, say at Stanford, to understand a business model of open sourcing everything and then building a service model around it. Those seem less metricy to me. That's okay. Um, I'm just trying to think through how we approach these things. Like some of them seem like um, things that we may be able to quantify like identifying funding agencies that support open source, that could be an effort that we could put forward um, and, and kind of put numbers behind. I don't know what people's thoughts are on, on kind of that observation at all. Some of these might be numbers we could draw forward, you know, or, or data that we could put in front of people. Others are probably a bit of a longer game. Like talking to tech transfer is not just something. Yeah. I mean, we're still going to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you're, I think I, I, I plus one, your focus. Um, Cause like, you know, we have other projects and other venues for pursuing some of that other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I like how you're staying focused. Okay. Yeah. It's just these conversations are so interesting. 
you know, I would love to just be able to put a metric behind everything with a tool that you just push a button and it gives you the answer to the question you need, but um, that's not, obviously not always going to be the case. All right. Um, so again, thanks for that great conversation. Um, Stephanie, are you prepared to kind of talk um, about some of your things? I, I have to admit, I didn't actually add anything to the slides that were in there, but I thought that as okay. I was looking over them again, I do think the questions are actually pretty good. And I don't think we had a really, uh, big, uh, again, I don't think we um, really talked in detail about them previously. And if even if we did, I don't think the group that's here was part of that initial conversation or not everyone. So I think if we could just even go over where we were before, and I do apologize. I know I had it on my to-do list and suddenly didn't, it didn't make it onto my uh, okay. actual done list. Um, but, uh, but, and then I, I really liked how actually the discussion we were just having actually feeds into what we're, uh, uh, some of this and, um, and also the group that uh, Kendall was talking about. I think that it'd be interesting since we had that meeting on Friday, I'd be interested to see uh, how my, like how some of the, that discussions we have there impact like how these questions, especially the, the models and metrics models um, could could be kind of be, be developed. So, um, but yeah, no, I, I, I don't mind leading that. Yeah, I don't mind, totally don't mind leading a discussion about this and maybe um, adding to questions or uh, clarifying some questions as well as we as we go in the next, you know, the, the time we have. So does that sound okay? Or? Yeah, that sounds great. All right. So yeah, I mean, this I remember picking this one because it is something that we've, uh, you know, the the you know our reason for being is has specifically to do with uh, research translation, particularly in the commercial field. And um, uh, but we have also, I mean, cross not necessarily the OSPO effort, but cross specifically this you know cross was like that's where we got our start. But um, um, I think we've definitely seen. Or at least from us, like a movement away from just focusing on specifically on industry, uh, text transfer has as it as it, uh, as it relates to commercial specifically commercial activities, um, and we've definitely supported things that have uh, you know research uh, projects that have more of a, a social impact or research impact. So that's actually been a huge that was that big a change. Um, we were lucky to get funding from our school specifically to do that type of those type of efforts previously. So, um, so yeah, I think when I'm looking at the questions, especially in the first, let me see what the second, I can remember the second slide. Yeah, okay, this, this, so looking at identifying uh, the impact, I think is, um, I think that's an interesting question. And I, it's also how, you know, how do you define impact is a whole other aspect, I think, but, um, uh, and, but I, I like the question, like what and how and to what extent to what frequency are universities open source projects cited in publications? I think is an interesting one, um, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I was gonna say I not, and that one seems to be something that's there. There are tools out there to to discover. I mean, to discover uh, that you know and, and answer parts or get a good idea of that question. Um, and what universities, uh, what university open source projects are used in commercial settings? Um, my the one and the one I would add, I think, are this is, is maybe something unique to us, but um, what uh, what agree uh, you uh, what agreements are there? And kind of what we were talking about and identifying uh, uh, university research that's specifically uh, is specific to open open source project, meaning that they specify it within their project or or grant that they will open source, and that that's kind of a function of the fact that they got funding. So in our case, we do, um, you know, there's aside from stuff of the NSF and that type of funding, there is, we have what's called an open source, um, sorry, that, open source agreement, open source uh, letter. I'm, I'm like blanking out on that, but it's a letter that specifies or that basically says any a grant that we get or a gift that we get. Um, so it's like an open source gift agreement. It's, that's the term I was looking for. And so if a company is giving a gift to support food research, it specifies in there that we intend on um, open sourcing our um, the the whatever's coming out of that grant, which allows the companies to be a lot more involved with the discussions. There's no NDAs, which you know doesn't allow for any collaborations across across industries. So that's actually another one that um, I think could be a question of like it, are those type of how many of those type of mechanisms are within. Um, 
within uh, or being used within yeah. the research structure. Um, Kendall has a question or a comment. I think one thing that's really hard about the aspects of this is like, for example, an open source project created at a university that I know of here has two UVM contributors and then has like 10 from other universities. Okay. So like what is in a university is like not necessarily straightforward. And then you're like, you think about how you measure the impact of that. Someone else who uses, uses that package, like does UVM get a quarter of the, the connection to it? Like, how do you think about the weights of that kind of measurement when it comes to what that is? And there are many things where you may have students contributing things that are not as main contributors. They may not have originally written the project, but they're a larger factor later on that are maintaining it. Like, do you measure that as a University of Vermont open source project? Like the the get the line that you draw there is like tracing coastlines. It is more infinite the more you get into it. Um, and I think it's it's not a bad problem to have, but it is also like there's a lot of notable nuance when I think about this. I was talking to some people, uh, Open Source Collective Africa, their their open source group. And about collaborations with them and i was like so like are there local um, projects that we could work with you on and working on code from uvm to them and they're like local is kind of a weird word because it's you know across the entirety of africa there's not a local project and many of those are not like necessarily african citizens that are working on it so like how do you think about that it is it is a it is definitely a complicated piece and just even like tagging citations of that is, is a great place to start and also i think it's a very small piece of what that it becomes as you dig into it more that's a really good point. And I li like I like um, Zach's point about attracting external contributors as well, because that, that is something that we that that the research translation, I think, is specific to and th building community. But part of that is that, you know, if you the more contributors and the more users you're using from external, the more sustainable. There's a whole issue about sustainability. I don't think we, we get into with regards to um, tech translation. And I think that that's I mean, that's it's not part of a metric, but like that's kind of the, part of the ultimate goal of the translation is that it's getting used it's getting it's and it's and it's maintained being maintained and it's a long term going to still be around so in this in this slide i'm curious folks at your university open source offices how how many of you are tracking the the for example the social impact of the projects that you're that you're working on from purely a, a this is a a, a good in, in the world. This is a social good. And it's something that we as a university are, are making the world a better place. Sometimes I hear about like tracking impact so that we can roll that back up into like RPT processes, you know, like using that data kind of back internally. But are a lot of you doing that? Yeah, I don't know how you would do that either. It's, this is kind of this funny question of, you know, if you look at a lot of university websites, they talk about the impact that they have, the positive impact that they have in the world, and that's always put forward a lot. Um, and I'm just curious if any of you are tracking that kind of stuff. Definitely not. <laughs> um, I would love to, um, but I think I'm probably a year or more out from being able okay. to do that that level of sophistication. Okay. Where you can actually say we made a change here in a, in a positive whatever here might be in a positive way gotcha i don't feel like we're tracking it as well as we should but we are trying to tell find stories and tell them which is so it's not but it's yeah. not like i mean we need to do a little bit more of like larger data set but it's it's nice to when you're just when you're talking to your the leadership it's nice to have stories like that because that might even if it's just one single instance, if it is enough of an impact, then I think that it um, it makes an impression. Yeah. Okay. Um, how do if I was to take a look at these three, are they weighted differently at your university? Research, commercial, and social impact. I think each university is different. So I would say that different, even different UCs are different because I would say some of them probably would weigh commercial more than social impact, but, um, okay. Um, so I would, yeah, I think, and it also depends on who's like, who the leadership is at, at the moment, but they're too all, many. okay. <laughs> but I don't know how they're, they're all important, but I depend on 
the I moment get it. is a it's a little like so I, I'd, be I'd be interested in what other people say that's my impression at least of yeah. it, the, the it depends answer which i can I completely ex expect i think um that would be kind of a fun exercise because it wouldn't necessarily be the truth but it would be like an accurate <laughs> reflection of like what that person thinks about their university um, i guess i would say we would put research way out in front okay. of the other two okay I mean, there is a social impact to research, so... I understand. And sure. a commercial means, one. Yes. It was um, keeping these separate just for conversational purposes. Sean had kind of mentioned commercial impact in Missouri, so... Yeah, that's the... I mean, obviously research, that's, the, of course, the first order thing, but when it comes to why they value stuff, it's entirely because of commercial like, and this is all with respect to like research translation, like how that research lives, exactly, exactly. lives, beyond, lives out in the world. So, okay. Um, I have a, okay. I, I was, there's, there's one other thing I think we might say about research translation and that okay. has to do with reproducibility because that has a direct impact on how translatable research is, especially in biomedical. So like, um, I think there's a chance that if we develop really strong open source software that will have a direct impact on reproducibility. Um, right now, um, pharma and biomedical industry has to rerun. So they're constantly hunting in, um, you know, the academic literature for leads uh, for in, but they have to rerun everything and they don't trust our results um, because they can't. Um, but if through some combination of better data curation, better data sharing, open source software. What if our reproduce, what if our results were more attractive to industry that way? So I think, I think reproducibility has a seat at the table when it comes to talking yep. about translation. I like that. Uh, yeah, Kendall, you have a response to that? I mean, I think that's such a good thing. And I, I keep thinking of something that when I was working in software companies, we had like things like pen, pen testing, we were trying to throw codes into your monkey, a monkey into your codes and see what happens, right? Like, are there elements that we can do that are creating open source tools that go with open source libraries that do that kind of testing? Like things that that are, that one, they would understand as industry partners are like, oh yeah, like, I've seen this, I've done this before in my own code, and also makes it more robust and commonly testable to be like, does this actually work? I love it. Uh, this is great. So I have a lo lot of notes just kind of in my notebook here. Um, and I think we have a lot of things captured just kind of in the conversation on these slides. Um, what I'll continue to do is, is work on these and refine them uh, and continue to bring them back to the group. We're at the end of time. There's always a very converse, uh, good conversation from everybody. And I hope that this is helpful for, for folks on the call, just kind of listening and learning from others. Sounds like a lot of a lot of people are all in the same spot and trying to address the same questions. Mm -hmm. Matt, I was also planning on working on updating those, and then I, I like that Zach brought in the reproducibility because that was one a note I had to myself. It's also yeah having having more of that, and but I was thinking about like I said, waiting until the that meeting we have on Friday, which may add a little bit more. That'd be great. I get my help just uh, the, the you know, I even clarify the questions even further. So. Cool. That'd be great, Stephanie. Thanks. All right, everybody. Well, we're approaching the U.S. holiday, so hopefully you have. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're not there yet, Matt. We got. I said approaching. I didn't say we're there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was careful with my words. So, yeah. all right, everybody. Uh, have a great day, and we'll talk to y'all later. I really appreciate it. Bye, everyone. Bye.